Hey guys, for the last slideshow, we ended with the Boston Massacre, which was kind of a marker for how bad things had gotten between the Americans and the British, but things keep getting worse, and in today's slideshow, we're going to see how we go from Americans protesting British taxes to violent military resistance of British rule. The goals of these videos are listed here. You should, by the end, be able to explain how colonial protest grows into military resistance, and you should be able to explain the role played by the first Continental Congress in organizing colonial protests. Uh, some vocab terms you need to know are listed right there. You should probably go ahead and write them down. So after the Boston Massacre, a lot of people are very upset about the British, the new British laws, and what they see as British tyranny. Um, coming over, sending soldiers, killing Americans. But there's still peace between the Brits and the Colonials. People are unhappy, but there is, as of yet, no warfare. But a lot of people, especially in England, are very unhappy, and they begin to organize resistance against the British. And one of the most important leaders in this resistance of the British is a guy named Samuel Adams, who lived in Boston and was a brewer by trade. But he actually went out of business and actually ended up having, I guess, a lot of time to spend organizing against the British. And one of the most important things he does is he sets up this thing called a Committee of Correspondence. And this is where leaders from all over the colonies down in the south and up in New England and the middle colonies as well, all exchange letters. That way they can keep in touch about how, what they think about resisting the British. Um, this is important because it allows the different leaders in the different colonies to begin working together on this issue. So the background of the Boston Tea Party has to do with a big British company called the East India Company. Uh, the British government gives this company a monopoly on selling tea in the colonies. Uh, this makes the colonists unhappy for a couple reasons. First of all, the British are offering this British company an unfair advantage in selling tea, and it, the British also place a small tax on all the tea that this company is going to sell, so it's kind of like a sneaky way for the British to try and tax the colonists. Uh, but the colonists resist. Most of the ships carrying tea are forced to turn back or are burned in American harbors. So in New York, in Annapolis, in Philadelphia, no tea gets unloaded. In Boston, though, where the British are the most serious about enforcing their laws, the ships actually dock and are about to be unloaded and the tea is going to be sold and everything. But uh, what happens is a group of people from Boston uh, sneak onto these ships dressed as Indians and steal all of the tea and throw it overboard. Uh, and so the British East India Company loses a ton of money and the Americans thwart the British attempt to tax tea in America. This, of course, makes the British pretty angry. In response to the Boston Tea Party, the British come down hard. They're angry, they're tired of the colonists ignoring what they tell them to do. And so they pass a series of laws that the people in the colonies call the Intolerable Acts. I'm sure the British had a nicer name for them. But so these acts are passed to punish the colonists. And what it does is it basically uh, reduces the amount of freedom that the colonists can enjoy. Uh, they have less self-government, that is that the British more or less just tell the people in the colonies what they have to do instead of letting any of the colonists vote on these matters. And the more English soldiers are shipped over and they are paid for by the colonists. Uh, this, of course, makes a lot of people pretty upset. Another thing that uh, really angers the colonists is that Parliament, the people in Britain, pass the Quebec Act. And what this does is it expands British Canada southward. So Canada was then going to include places like Michigan and Ohio and 
Illinois. This also angers the colonists because they believe that they fought for this territory during the French and Indian War and that now it's being taken away from them and given to the people in Canada. Both of these things combine to make the colonists upset and they unite in order to resist these new British measures. Here's the first Continental Congress and convinces them that they should continue to pursue a revolutionary strategy. And what that is, is instead of making up with the British and saying sorry and trying to get them to repeal the laws that way, he convinces the Continental Congress that they need to keep fighting the British, keep ignoring their taxes, keep boycotting their goods, until the British give up and cancel all of the new taxes and laws that they've passed. So that's John Adams' really important contribution in the First Continental Congress. Uh, so, the significance of the Continental Congress is two main things. First of all, all of the colonies are now working together to fight the British. Uh, and this makes the colonies much stronger and will eventually help them to resist the British militarily. Second, uh, they agree not only to continue resisting the British, but they uh, amp up their resistance in a couple ways. So rather than just boycotting certain British goods, all of the members at the Congress agree to boycott all British goods. So now the colonists refuse to buy anything that was made in Britain, and they refuse to sell anything to Britain. Uh, the British are not happy about this new turn of events, and so they begin sending even more troops to Boston, which is kind of the hotbed of uh, resistance to British rule. Uh, in response to this, colonists begin to form militias, and a militia is just kind of a, uh, a volunteer army. These people aren't paid, it's not their real job, but they agree to work together as an army of armed men to resist the British. And so these guys, part-time, begin training for war and stockpiling weapons and ammunition, just in case the British try anything sneaky. Well, as you know, uh, as it would happen, the British do try something sneaky. They organize and march on the place where the militia is keeping all of its gunpowder. And these guys are planning on taking the militia's gunpowder, that way they won't be able to fight back against the British. But the militiamen hear that this is happening, and in response, they form up and attack the British troops that are trying to steal the gunpowder. Um, this leads to what is known as the Battle of Lexington and Concord, fought in two small towns outside of Boston. And it's a bunch of British versus, versus a bunch of uh, American militiamen. And the militiamen actually kill about or kill or wound about 300 British soldiers. Um, then the militia, after the British people uh, retreat, surround Boston and try to trap the rest of the British troops in there. So this is the beginning of military resistance, and it kind of sparks the beginning of the whole Revolutionary War. Uh, but as of yet, nobody has officially recognized this violence, and it's just kind of Americans spontaneously attacking the British. But from there, there's going to be more organization, and eventually all of the colonies are going to back up these militiamen and decide to fight against the British. So the Lexington and Concord is kind of the spark that sets fire, uh, that starts the fire of the Revolutionary War. You understand these two main points, and that you know what these vocab terms mean. All right, see you tomorrow.